fewer than that. That's a we are recording all of them because they are on. Uh, no, you're not. Uh, they uh, are on a on our website, and it's really good for people to be able to access those and hear people's stories. So uh, Justin's been doing a great job on that. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Lynn and Mallory. Well, this is the first time that I've ever been able to come to a faculty forum, so I don't know what the protocol is, and I don't know really much about what I'm supposed to do, other than Susan told me to talk about my path to my doctorate and how I got to LCU, and so I typed out a few things. I was a communications major, and I was taught that you're not supposed to read your um, speeches, and typically I try not to, but I did want to pay attention to my time constraints not bore everybody. At least try not to bore everybody. So, um, I grew up in Carlsbad, New Mexico. To, I was raised by two LCU alums. And um, New Mexico has many things to offer. A superb public school system is not one of them. Mm. And so um, it was easy to be a big fish in the small ponds when you went to school in New Mexico. And I, I loved school. I did well. I graduated 8th out of 480 students and um, wow. was ranked very high on the standardized test that they give to you. And I got some nice invitations to some nice Ivy League universities to apply. Um, and I probably was a little bit big for my britches, if we're being honest. <laughs> because, again, it's just really easy to be a big fish in a small pond when the other fish are kind of sickly and dying and um, the quality is, is suffering. <laughs> and so I wasn't real excited about coming to LCU. I didn't want to come to LCU as a student. Um, my parents told me that I could go to college anywhere I wanted, but if they were going to pay for it, I had to go to a Church of Christ University, which narrowed down my options considerably. And um, I checked out the other options since nobody was going to pay for me to go to Yale or Brown, and honestly, I probably wouldn't have gotten, it, gotten in even if I had applied. I checked out my other options, and in the end, um, LCU seems like the place that would feel the most like home, and I loved it here. I had a great time. I had a lot of opportunities for leadership. I had a lot of people who took me under their wing and um, formed relationships with me. Oddly enough, I did not have the experience of growing close to many faculty members. Um, I was a business communications major, and at that time, the department was rather small, and we had only adjunct faculty teaching. And um, the professor, or the, the instructor I had the most was a really nice woman. I didn't necessarily share all of the values and mission of, of LCU, and I didn't have that experience of really growing close to a faculty member or mentor, being mentored by a faculty member. But I did have a lot of strong relationships with staff members, and, um, and I knew a lot of other faculty members elsewhere on the campus. And, um, which was good, because I was very lost. I did not know what I wanted to do. I entered as an accounting major. Steve German helped me set up my first schedule. <laughs> And I quickly realized that I was not cut out to be an accounting major. I never even took an accounting class. So I proceeded to change my career path four or five times, I think. Um, I was going to... Six? Okay. I lost track. A personal financial planner. I was going to be a nutritionist. I was going to be a motivational speaker. I was going to be... What I really wanted to do was be a preacher. And I talked to my dad about that so many, several times, and he said, John Mark, it's not real big for that. I think you should choose another major. And so I finally settled on business communications, not knowing what I was going to do with that. And I realized that um, somewhere in the midst of all of my hopping around to different majors, that the theme was that I wanted to do something that helped people and made a difference in the lives of people. So um, 
I owe a great deal of my status here at LCU to Beth Robinson because I called her one day and I said, I think I might want to be a counselor. What do I do about that? And she told me about the marriage and family therapy program at ACB. Now, there are a few things um, that I'd like to point out. First of all, I had a psychology 101 class under my belt, and that was it. <laughs> I had no business going into a graduate program for therapists. Um, second, or secondly, as my students say now in their papers, secondly, <laughs> Um, marriage and family therapy is its own profession. We're not a subspecialty of LPCs, we're not psychologists, we're not psychiatrists. Uh, we have our own accredited master's and doctoral programs, we have our own license, we have our own standards of practice. I knew nothing about this when I applied for the marriage and family therapy program at ACU. I was quite ignorant. Um, but I showed up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at my interview, and um, Wayman Henson was the head of the program, and he told me that um, if you walked like a duck and you sounded like a duck, you probably were a duck. <laughs> Which I took to mean that either I walked and looked like a very odd person, or maybe I might look like a therapist in the making. So I graduated from LCU in four years, and then because my parents told me they would only pay for four years. And then I started at ACU. And I had the assumption that if I didn't like this, I would just quit. And I would go get a job. I had a degree. And I, because I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. I was just kind of coming. And when I got there, I loved it. And it was, I worked harder at ACU than I had ever worked. It was the first time that I felt really academically challenged. Um, Wayman Henson used to say that it was a well-oiled well machine, that program was. And I still think that clinically it's one of the strongest therapy programs in the country. And when I graduated, I felt, I felt proud of that degree. I felt like I had worked very hard um, and had been pushed and I had accomplished something. I <clears throat> didn't, however, to know what I wanted to do um, for a good chunk of the time that I was there. I thought that I would get a degree in therapy and that I would maybe go work uh, for a church and be a full-time counselor on staff. I have done that in the last couple of years. That is a very hard job, and I don't know that I will ever do that again. <laughs> um, I would much rather be a faculty member and see some clients on the side. So while I was there, I, I, I floated around trying to figure out what I was going to do. I was very discouraged to realize that I was going to make absolutely nothing when I graduated from the program. <coughs> and there was one female faculty member who, whose name was Jackie Halstead. And somewhere along the way, she mentioned to me that she thought that I was cut out to do PhD work. And that thought had never crossed my mind. I did well in school, but it had never occurred to me that that was something that I could do or that I, I should give my hand at doing. And she encouraged me to apply for programs. So again, I called Beth Robinson, <coughs> who honestly, Beth did not know me. I had for one psych I had the the single psychology 101 course that I had. I had in the Cardwell lecture hall. I sat in the back of the lecture hall with another student who had Tourette's and randomly shouted out curse words in the middle of class. And that was the only time that I ever had that. So she didn't really know me. But I called her and I said, I'm thinking about applying for graduate school. Would there be any chance that in a few years there might be a place for me to teach at LCU? And at the time, she was head of the chair of the program, or the department, and was blowing and going and doing her thing and bringing in record numbers of students into the department. And she said, yes, we will need you. And if she had not told me that, I don't think I would have even applied uh, to get my PhD. I, I wasn't so much excited about getting my PhD as I was about the thought of being able to come back to LCU. And so, because she said yes, there was a possibility and I applied for program, and I was accepted to Texas Tech's Marriage and Family Therapy Program, 
which is a very strong program that has a very strong reputation in the marriage and family therapy world. It was very challenging for me in different ways than ACU was challenging. The first reason was that um, I wasn't accepted right off the bat. I was put on a waiting list. And when they finally um, offered me a position, I never really knew if all of the faculty members were on board with that decision to offer me a position. Mm -hmm. Still to this day, I don't know whether all the, the faculty members were on board with that. And um, <clears throat> I was not good at politics. I um, was not the shining star of the program. I was not really certain whether many of the faculty members were happy that I was there. Um, and I, I think I was probably just as bright as my other colleagues were, but I was not prepared for the level of research um, that was required. And I think more than that, I didn't have a faculty mentor to guide me through the process. And I didn't know that I needed a faculty mentor to guide me through the process. And so for the first two years, um, I just, I floundered. I felt very inadequate. Um, I, I took my classes, and I, and I made good grades, and I did well. Um, I, I forgot to tell you at the beginning that I maintained a 4.0 from the time I was in the fourth grade until my last semester of doctoral work, when I got a B in my advanced statistics class. And I had a very unhealthy attitude that was your 4.0 is like your virginity. <laughs> Once you lose it, you can't get it back. I can't, I maintained a 4.0. I can't say that that was really the best reason uh, to do that or that I got everything out of my education that I could have with that attitude. It's going on Facebook. That's good. <laughs> it can go on Facebook. I've said it many times with a little bit of embarrassment. Um, so I, 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 did, I did my job, and I, I did well, but, but I floundered on a personal level. Um, I just, I felt very lost. I felt very inadequate. Um, I was certainly very humbled. I was no longer a big fish in the small ponds. I was very much the small fish um, in this setting. And um, towards the end of my second year, my faculty advisor took another job at a different university. And so I had to choose another advisor, and I'd had, I'd had a different advisor every year that I had been there. So I, um, I chose a new advisor whom I had been working with some. I, I had to take him for a class that semester. His name was Steve Harris. And um, Steve was God's tool in getting me through my PhD. I honestly, and I told him that, I honestly don't know if I would have finished um, had God not placed him in my life. Uh, Steve was Mormon, and he appreciated my conservative values like I appreciated his. And we had a lot of great talks about faith and doctrine and what it was to be a single Church of Christ female past the median age for marriage. And... Um, <clears throat> Steve was genuine with the students that he mentored. He invited us into his home. I watched his children for four days while he and his wife took a trip. Um, he shared about the areas of his professional life that he struggled with, the areas that he didn't feel he was very good at. Um, and in short, he shared life with us, and he made it safe to be imperfect. And that's what I needed at that point, because I certainly <clears throat> felt um, less than perfect. I felt less than adequate. And um, Steve taught me the value of having a faculty mentorship that is genuine and is focused and is real. <clears throat> and that was the first experience I had had with that, which made a huge impression on me. It was not the only lesson that God had for me while I was... Um, working on my PhD. The two days before I was supposed to defend my dissertation, I remember I was in my room at, at my apartment, 
literally sit to my stomach because I was pretty convinced I was about to fail my dissertation defense. <laughs> so I was praying about it because it occurred to me that perhaps that would be a smart thing to do at this point, this juncture in time. And as I was praying, I, um, I heard a voice, felt the voice, the prompting that you get that you know is, is the Spirit, that said to me, have you done the best that you could do? And I knew in that moment that I could answer that question, yes. <coughs> I had not, the, the question was not, did you outshine your other colleagues? Have you, are you the best <coughs> student that they have seen in this program? Have you done perfectly? Have you, um, have you been better than any other student who has come through this program. It was simply, have you done the best that you could do? And I felt like I could honestly say, yeah, I did the best I could do with the abilities I have in this time and place that I was called to use them. And then I felt her sensed whatever, a, a response that said, that's all that I ask of you. Don't put this on. <laughs> that was huge for me. Mm -hmm. For a girl who had lived her whole life um, valuing her self worth on what she produced and how good she was at something, to <clears throat> recognize that God was not asking her, He was not comparing her to anyone else. He was only asking her to use what he had given her in the time and place that he had called her to do that. And it didn't have to be better than anyone else's. In fact, it could be a failure. And he would still be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who was pretty convinced they were about to fail their dissertation defense, that was even bigger. Because I needed to know that it was going to be okay <coughs> if I failed. Um, I didn't fail, thankfully. It was not a pretty defense, but I did not fail. <laughs> and, um, and I took I took some really important lessons with me into my work at LCU. Beth, true to her word, when I uh, got to the, finished with my coursework in the year I was writing my dissertation, and um, there there was a spot. Um, open for me. And so I started here full time as an assistant professor in the fall of 2007. And I worked that year while I was writing my dissertation and then um, in the fall of 2008. I, I graduated in the spring of 2008 with my PhD. And um, I took some important lessons with me into, into my work. Uh, the first was that I try, I remember Jackie Halstead telling me, you could do PhD work. You could do that. And so I try to remember to plant ideas in the minds of my students that you can do more than what you've ever considered doing. You can do bigger things than what you've considered doing. Um, I try to <coughs> offer a relationship with my students that's real and that's genuine <coughs> and that's focused. Um, one of the things Steve taught me, one of the things I appreciated was that not all of the students cared for him. Not all the students really liked his methods and his ways of doing things, but for the students with whom he connected and built a relationship, he had a very profound impact on them. Not all of the students care for my methods. Not all of them like me. But for the ones that are placed in my path, um, what I try to remember is that God has asked me to do the best that I can with the abilities I have and the time and place that I have been called to use them and to influence those students uh, in the ways that I can. I love LCU. I, it is my dream job. I love the fact that I can influence the careers of students, but more than that, that I can influence them. <coughs> and that we can have conversations that are meaningful and conversations that are important because they're not just about their career, they're about kingdom work. And um, I, 
I am grateful that I have a chance to do my dream job in a place that did so much for me as I was starting out. And that is my story. Unlike most academics, you did not even take half of your time. <laughs> I know, I just got <laughs> here. My dad says that, my dad the preacher says that when you are leading prayers, if you would talk to God more often, you wouldn't have to talk to him so long. <laughs> so my, my approach is that I talk to people fairly often. I don't have to talk a long time. Okay. Well, uh, protocol is that I ask the first question. Okay, so you did not tell us the title of your dissertation or what it was about, so teach us a little. My dissertation, and... <laughs> the, title, the title is Congregants' Responses to Clergy Pornography Addiction. Um, and I look specifically, I use our LCU population as my as my survey population, and I look specifically at college-age students' responses to ministers with pornography addiction. Um, it was a hypothetical, they, they were case studies, they weren't um, real-life scenarios. Here's, here's Minister X with his pornography addiction, what do you think about him? It was case studies, what do you think about the situation? <coughs> and what I found was that um, our college students are really pretty grace-giving and accepting mm -hmm. of of that. Mm -hmm. um, it was not, my dissertation was not what I wanted to do. Um, but Steve had some practical wisdom about this is not your life work, this is about you getting done. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I wanted to do, uh, what I really like doing in my practical and my practice is couple therapy. And what I wanted to do was a qualitative study on ministers who um, go through a divorce mm. while they're in the pulpit. And maybe someday I'll still, I'll still do that. But. Very good. Anyone? I came in late. Yes? What was your major when you were here? Business communication. Okay. I couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. I very little to do with my field now. <laughs> I, I gathered that from what I came in on, so, but I couldn't remember yes. what your major was. Yes. And if I could go back and do it again, I would have been a Bible major. Lena, what was it like to go from ACU with training that has theological underpinnings to mm -hmm. Texas Tech's training, which probably did not have theological mm -hmm. underpinnings for the same field of study? And for me, it was a struggle. I don't think it would be a struggle for anybody. I think it has to do with my personality type and the way that I'm geared. Um, and the, the bigger struggle, I think the bigger struggle for me was, um, this really doesn't need to go online. There's a lot of nuts in our field. <laughs> That's just how it is. And that that part was, was hard for me. Mm. That some of you people need to deal with some stuff before you go out and get involved in other people's lives. Um, but <laughs> that, I don't know if that answers your question. <clears throat> Hopefully. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you mentioned. <clears throat> My, my experience with the Joyner family has been that all, especially all the sisters, exude quite a bit of confidence. Uh, the three of you that I've known through the years. Yet, all through this, you talked a lot about being lost or being mm -hmm. kind of disoriented and all this. So, what uh, can you share a little bit more about that? Where does that come from? And, and how you, how'd you deal with that? I think, I, I think that was part of my journey, Steve. I think that. Um, I'm very grateful for the foundation that my parents laid for us. Um, we did all have a, a measure of, of self-assurance and, and who we were and self-worth. Um, but I remember, I, I meant to put this in and I forgot, Jeff Carey was teaching some adjunct courses when I was, was here and I had him for a course. I can't tell you what course it was. I can't tell you anything about the class other than 
One day he asked a question, if the thing that was most important to you was taken away from you, what would you do? And I remember as a student contemplating that, and he wasn't talking about people, if the person who, it was, it was more about, about you, and I remember thinking, well, my intellect. If my intellect was taken away from me, I, that's, that's probably what I value the most. And so I had, I had built a, much of who I was and much of my self-worth was built around this ability that I have. And I, and I don't, I was not cocky or pride, well, I'm sure there was, there was pride in that, but I, I was not cocky or boastful about it. It's simply that I didn't have an understanding of my worth being something that came inherently because of Christ, mm -hmm. just because of who I was, mm -hmm. not because of any ability that I had or anything that I did, or it was just, it just was. And so I think um, those four years in, in grad, in, at Tech were challenging for me because um, it was the first time that this one area of my life, there are a lot of areas of my life that I'm just not good at and I'm okay with. I'm a really lousy athlete. I'm okay with that. So there's a lot of things I'm okay with. But this was the, the place that I had built myself for, and suddenly I wasn't good at it, or at least I felt like I wasn't good at it. And it really threw my whole identity for a loop. And I think that that needed to happen. <coughs> I remember <coughs> Beth and I started the same year, and I was finished with my PhD, but she was just starting. <coughs> and uh, she came in from, or she called me after her first class and said, my professor said, um, I hate the following and you need to make note of that. Christians, small towns, West Texas, athletes, football. <laughs> and she just gave this list. And she repeated Christians, I think, twice. Um, and Beth said, how am I going to get through this? Because everything that I am is on her list of hated things. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, and, I, and I've known several others who went through that program mm -hmm. and really faced some difficulties mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So do you think that part mm -hmm. of your feeling a little bit inadequate was that in some ways you might have been a little persecuted? Um. I went through a different program than, than Beth did, but when I entered the program, um, I was assigned to a faculty advisor, um, whose name I won't mention, who's very beloved, Mike loves him. Uh, he, did not, he did not care for white conservative Christian girls. And that, that was not just me, there were several other females in the program who had the same experience. I do think that that was, yeah. <laughs> that that was part of it. I, I he gave me a hard time. I wasn't white conservative. Or uh, uh, well, you were. <laughs> was, you, was, you, was, were <laughs> you were white and you were female. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were a minority. You got in. Um, and I, yes, definitely. There, there was a little bit of that. Um, you, what I found, part of what I found in uh, having Dr. Harris as an advisor, was some safety. You know, because when you feel inadequate. Or when you feel, um, when you've got vulnerable areas, when you feel like you're having to protect yourself all the time, you can't deal with those vulnerable areas because you're in defense mode all the time. And so what Steve offered me was a place to be able to not have to be in defense mode and deal with some of the stuff that you need to deal with. And have you sent students out into the world and what advice do you give them? I sent students out into the I mean, world, into the graduate world. Into the graduate world. I encourage, <clears throat> I've had a number of students I've encouraged to go to graduate school. Um, and sometimes, it's not always students that I have a real close relationship with, but I know that even in the case of, of Jackie, I didn't have a, an especially close relationship with her, uh, but I did look up to her as a female um, role model. And simply those couple of times that she dropped that idea, that she planted that idea in my head, 
it made a really big difference for me. And so I just try to plant those ideas into their heads and um, encourage them to that they can do that. They can do this. Someone else? Just for the record, I think you were one of the most brilliant people I've ever had in class. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do. I have a really important question. That bracelet is amazing. What did you think? <laughs> Dillard's on clearance. Oh. Yeah. All right, right after got this. matching earrings, but they're just a little bit too blingy for school. Ooh, all right. We can get my car and zip to Dillard's. Right Does anybody have a serious question? <laughs> I just did that for you, Dr. B, because you'd be like, oh. Okay. Carol. <laughs> We are just so blessed to have you in our department. Thanks, Mike. So blessed. Thanks. I'm very blessed to be there. It's a good place to work. I have a question. Where'd you meet Mr. your husband? Online. Be harmony. Huzzah again. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm the guy we're new. Most people probably don't. <laughs> we like to make up outrageous stories about how we met. <laughs> and then when we tell them that we met on the Harmony, then they never believe us because the first story was also outrageous. <laughs> There's some psychology. <clears throat> well, I think it says a lot about you and your character and your love for LCU that you drive back and forth mm -hmm. from Midland. I do love my job. I would not drive back and forth otherwise. Mm -hmm. How do you use your time in the car? Um, it depends. If I can get some of my, something relevant to class that I can listen to, then I will, you know, I listen to books on tape, I listen to a lot of Beth Moore lessons on, on CD, do a lot. My morning is my, I get a whole two hours to wake up, which is good, because I'm usually kind of blurry eyed when I leave the house. So I have two hours in the morning to do devotional time, and I can sing, and I try to keep my eyes open when I'm <laughs> praising and singing and listening to Beth more. You don't and raise both hands. Do I don't raise both hands. Okay. Usually just one. Okay. <laughs> That's good when you drive. You ever think there's any opportunity to, that you'll get to move closer? I would love to. Uh, the Lord does not. I, I finally realized the other day that um, He knows. He knows I would like to leave Midlands. And He's not doing anything about that right now. So <laughs> apparently that's where I'm going to be for a little bit. Until something changes. Yeah. Anyone else? Lynn Ann, thank you so much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Wonderful.